Today's reading is taken from, well, it's the whole of Psalm 130. <clears throat> Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, if you can keep your Bibles out to Psalm 130 as we go through it, let's pray that God will speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your words that assures us that we are yours, and people whom you have redeemed by the price of your, the blood of your Son. And Lord, we pray that you would speak the words of assurance today, Lord, as we come to these uh, words. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know if you remember, but after months and years of speculation and lying and denial, Lance Armstrong, the seven-time Tour de France winner, scheduled an interview with Oprah Winfrey. Oprah asked him if he could ask just yes or no, if she could ask yes or no questions at the beginning of the interview. And so she went on to ask, did you ever take banned substance to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusion to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever use any other banned substance such as testosterone, cortisone, or human growth hormone? Yes. He answered. He went on to say, I viewed the whole situation as a one big lie that I repeated many times. One big lie that I repeated many times. Lies are like that, uh, aren't they? The lies, you, you sort of dig yourself into this hole, and each time you lie, you dig yourself deeper and deeper into the same hole until you feel trapped and you can't get out of the lie um, anymore. And if you are on a national TV, and if you've lied to the national media and international media, how much harder is it to then admit that you have done something wrong to get out of that hole? And none of us has had to live with that sort of international, national scrutiny. Uh, but we kind of, I think, know. We can relate to feeling trapped in, in situations like this, feeling trapped in our own lives, feeling trapped because of the things that we've done, maybe a sin that we've committed, uh, the promise that we didn't keep, or uh, other situations where we feel alone with the secrets of the things that we have done wrong, and we feel that we can't get out of it, that we're deep in it. This psalmist is in such a hole. The opening words of the psalm is, out of the depths I cry out to you. He cries out of the depths. Uh, and God listens and God delivers. He shows his mercy. Now, to be sure, this depth isn't literal. Uh, the word, this Hebrew word for depth, the commentators tell me, occur five times in the Old Testament. Most of the times it's associated with the depth of the water. Uh, depth of the water, like in Isaiah 51, Ezekiel 27, or Jonah 2. Out of the depth of the water, people cry out to God. And this song, but you also see that this is a song of ascent, a song that pilgrims sang as they went up to Jerusalem, as they went to their pilgrimage towards the temple to offer their sacrifices, to sing praises to God. Uh, but you, if you know Jerusalem, you know that Jerusalem is bone dry. <laughs> there is no watery depths around Jerusalem. This depth is not literal depths. It's the moral depth. It's the figurative 
depth of sin uh, that he is into. Of course, verse 2 makes this um, clear too. He cries out for mercy. You don't cry out for mercy for things that, uh, uh, that you haven't done. You cry out for mercy because you know that you don't deserve mercy. But you cry out anyway because of the things that you have done. And verse 3, of course, makes it crystal clear. If you, Lord, kept the record of sin, Lord, who could stand? You see, this is a song of a pilgrim going towards the temple, going up towards the temple to offer sacrifices for the sins that he has committed, that he knows that he cannot be forgiven for, that he can't make up for. It's, he doesn't deserve to be rescued, but he asks for it anyway. Friends, what do you do when you have been in such a depth, when you have been in that sort of trouble? Maybe you've told a lie that you can't untell. Maybe you are addicted to some sin. Maybe you've broken a promise and you've done things. Maybe you haven't done the things that you know that you should have done. And maybe you have done some things that you feel deeply ashamed of every time you think about it. It brings you shame and guilt. And sin is like that hole. It isolates you. It makes you feel alone because you are with it and you can't tell anybody. You can't share it with others. In these situations, we're alone, and we start hiding our guilt. We start lying more and dig ourselves into deeper into that hole, and we start to feel like we can't be forgiven, and we start to feel like we're far away from God. God cannot possibly listen to me. But you know, in the Bible, this watery depth is distance-wise as far away from God God who is in heavens. It's as far away from God, and you feel that way, that you are as far away from God as you can possibly be, that God cannot, God cannot hear you. But out of the depths, the psalmist cries out to God, and God hears his prayers. God is right there with him in the depths. Maybe you have felt like that, but maybe there are, there are some of you who think, wow, this isn't really for me. I haven't done really anything that bad. I'm, I, I'm not a bad person. Um, this, is, this psalm isn't really for me. But uh, take a look at verse 3. This is a situation of the whole human race, isn't it? If you, Lord, kept the record of my, uh, of my, of my sins, who can stand? Who could stand? The answer, of course, is no one. No one could stand in front of God. I mean, we, we, we went through Romans, and remember Romans uh, chapter 3, where he quotes from Psalm 14. Uh, there's no one righteous. There's no one righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of glory of God. There's no one righteous. On the day of the judgment, if God replays all our thoughts, all our words, things that we should have done, things that we didn't do, things that we have done, none of us would stand with our heads held high. Our knees would buckle, and we would prostrate before Him, and we would ask for mercy before the Holy God. Friends, in front of God, we're all in the depths. We're all in this depth in need of God's forgiveness. And so ask for forgiveness. You know, that's what we do every week in our service. In the Anglican service, we start the service with confession, don't we? And one pastor put it this way. Confession reminds us that none of us gather to worship, gather for worship because we're pretty, pretty good people. But we're a new people people marked by grace in spite of ourselves because of the work of Christ. Our communal life is the, our communal practice of confession reminds us that our failure, uh, that the failure in the Christian life is the norm. Failure in the Christian life is the norm. We each and all take part in gathered worship as unworthy people who, left on our own, deserve God's condemnation. But we're not left on our own. And that's the good news, that we're not left on our own. Even in the depth of that pit, we're not left on our own, that God hears us, that God is with us, so we can cry out to God. And 
we should want to confess because we know that as we go to God, that forgiveness is for sure. It's assured. This pilgrim is heading towards the, uh, the temple because he knows, verse 4, that with God there is forgiveness. With God is forgiveness. And it goes on to say in verse 7, with the Lord is unfailing love. With him is redemption, full redemption. This is who God is. With him is forgiveness. With him is love. With him is redemption. This is speaking about God's nature, who God is, not something that he does. With him, everywhere God goes, goes redemption with uh, forgiveness and, and love. That this is who God is. And once again, in our service, in our communion service, we sometimes pray the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this, your table, uh, merciful Lord, but, uh, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. And in the end, we say, you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. We can confess, we can come to the communion table because Jesus, uh, uh, the nature of God, is one uh, that, that, that always has mercy. Have you ever been strategic in your apology <laughs> in asking for forgiveness? You know, if you're married, you might have done something like this. You know, uh, say that I've done something wrong. I might buy some flowers on the way back um, from work. You know, I put the kids to bed. I do the dishes. I put Mary, I give her a glass of wine. I put her in the best mood possible. And then as she is resting well, I might say, oh, by the way, actually... <laughs> Well, we do things like this because people are inconsistent, right? When you catch somebody in a good mood, uh, little things, I mean, things like this might seem little. It might seem like a big deal, but when you're in a bad mood, well, little things also get blown up out of proportion, and you never know what you're going to get with people. And actually, this is how often people thought of God. When they thought of God, they thought that God was just like us, unpredictable, uh, erratic, uh, changeable. And when Greeks, and they certainly thought of God this way, Greeks were like us. And they never knew when they offered sacrifices to God what they're going to get. Maybe God will hear them. Maybe God won't. But our God, Yahweh God, is not like that. The word, the, the theological word is divine simplicity. He is simple. He is who he revealed himself to be and with God, with God is forgiveness. With God is redemption and love. Uh, he always has mercy. He always will forgive us as we come to him. And that, of course, is the reason why we don't confess with fear and trembling, asking, not, well, being not sure whether God will forgive us. No, God will forgive us. Because this is who he is. With him is forgiveness, love, and redemption. Our confession should be carried out not in self-hatred, not in doubt, but in this quiet confidence in the nature of God. There is no doubt what he's going to do. But when somebody forgives you, in this way, often we do the terrible thing of taking that sort of forgiveness for granted, don't we? Uh, we might even take advantage of this person and treat this person as a fool. This isn't like that. Look how, once again, verse 4 ends. With you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. ESV is much more literal um, here. It says, but with you is forgiveness so that you may be feared. So that you may be feared. It's kind of a strange thing, isn't it? Why would you fear somebody who forgives you? Why? Why would, would you come to fear this person more, fear this God more? Clearly, this isn't about being scared, because that doesn't make sense, to be scared of somebody who forgives you. A fear of the Lord in the Old Testament isn't fear of punishment, but recognizing God's greatness, God's transcendence, 
and wanting then to honor Him and serve Him. You see, when we realize the magnitude of our sins, the depth that we are in, but we also realize God's great mercies, uh, the mercies that's beyond us, that has reached down to lift us up and forgives us again and again and again, then we become in awe. That sense of awe comes, sense of, uh, of love and, and desire to honor comes, sense of reverence comes. Of course, that's what we see on the cross. On the cross, we, see, we sense this reverence. On the cross, we know the sureness of God's forgiveness. Because in the, on the cross, we see Jesus dying for us. But at the same time, we're awed by him for what he has done for us, the extent to which he went to save us and to forgive us. That old spiritual, were you there? I think captures um, this uh, sentiment so well. It goes, were you there when they crucified the Lord? Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble and tremble. Sometimes it causes me to tremble at the awesomeness of the forgiveness that we have received in this transcendent love that God has shown us. It makes us revere Him, want to serve Him and honor Him. But with you, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. Friends, that kind of forgiveness is offered to us. And so this pilgrim, as he's heading up towards the temple, thinks of God's mercy and the forgiveness that he will receive, but he thinks that's not the only thing that he think he's thinking about. He longs for more. Well, what does he long for? What does he cry out for? Verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in, this wor- in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Have you ever tried to put a, a pull an all-nighter, stay awake all night? Maybe at work you had to do, do it at, at school or whatever. Remember how, you know, each blink, how like sort of your eyelids get heavy throughout the night. Each blink Each time you blink, it feels like an invitation to just rest in the warmth and coziness of the night. Just rest. Uh, um, And and it's hard. And it takes willpower to stay awake. Maybe you might slap yourself or go out for a walk um, at night. The watchmen were sentries um, of the city. They watched over the city to make sure that it was kept safe. It was an honorable job. It was a noble job. But... You can imagine 4 a.m., 5 a.m. comes, and all that the person wants is for the night to be over, for the morning to come. That's the feeling described in this passage. My whole being waits, more than the watchman waits, wait for the morning. But pay attention to what he's waiting for. You see, he's not waiting for just forgiveness. He doesn't just wait for his sticky guilt to be washed away. No. What does he wait for? He waits for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. I wait for Him. Not just His forgiveness, not just for Him to say, I forgive you. I wait for Him to come and be with me. That's what He's waiting for. Uh, When I discipline my kids, yeah, sometimes yeah, I, I, you know, I, I switch my tone. I, get, you know, I speak in a stern voice. If that, that doesn't work, time out is offered. If it, that, that doesn't work, sometimes my kids get spanked. And in all these instances, even from the very beginning of stern voice, they start crying. They start bawling, right? And they start just crying their eyes out. And, you know, at the end of that episode, I don't just say to my kids, you know, I forgive you. We're good. Give me a your fist bump or something. That's not what I do. How does that whole episode end? Well, it ends with usually Corey or Barney in my arms. I hug them. I kiss them. I tell them, you know what? It's okay. 
I really do forgive you. No matter what you have done, I am with you. I will never leave you. That is reconciliation. This pilgrim has been alienated from God. He's been away from Him. So he seeks forgiveness, but more than forgiveness, he seeks God Himself to come back with Him, to be in right relationship to Him. And he doesn't just want a a pronouncement of forgiveness. He wants the Lord Himself. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Friends, sin takes us away from our Lord. And that is the worst thing that can happen to any of us. Once again, we see that on the cross. You know, on the cross, Jesus suffered, didn't he? Uh, But he doesn't cry out uh, about his physical punishment. The crown of thorns, the nails on his end, the scourging that he received, he doesn't cry out in pain because of those things. Do you know what he cries out for on the cross? He cries out when he feels being torn apart from his father. Remember, he called God his father all of his life, but on the cross he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He feels the weight of sin and the separation that sin causes. That's what he cries out for because that is the most immense pain that any of us being stripped away from the goodness of God, the one who gave us our very being, the love of God, all of that, if we're completely torn away, that is the worst thing that we can experience. That is hell. And Jesus experiences that for us so that we might be reconciled, so we might have him, we might be with him, we might know his forgiveness, love, and redemption. Friends, if you're not yet a Christian, that sense of alienation, that sense of not being right, I think that it manifests itself in in the sense of restlessness, that nothing in this world satisfies you. St. Augustine has put it so well in the opening words of his confession, uh, you, Lord, have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And if you feel that sense of restlessness, cry out to him. He will run to you and he will be with you. Turn to him and in repentance. And if you are a Christian, this is my prayer for all of you, that you would know the fullness, fullness of that forgiveness and love and redemption. St. Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus in chapter 3 that he's praying for them to have the power to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. How wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. I hope you know the fullness of that love, that redemption in Jesus. And if you have experienced that redemption, I hope we'll become a people who tell others about that love who shares this good news with others. This pilgrim in Psalm 130 started out crying out for himself. Out of the depth, I cry out to you. How does it end in verses 7 and 8? He ministers to others. He turns to others around him. He sees people who are in despair, who need to be forgiven, who need God's love and redemption. And so he turns to them. He says, Israel, Put your hope in the Lord. You, all of you, put your hope in the Lord, for that's where I have found it. He's ministering to them. Now, I know that most of you look fine, but you have, been, you have guilt that you don't share with anybody. It's the same way with everyone. I think I was 16. I think I was 16 when I found out that I have an aunt that I had never known about. Uh, It's because during the uh, Korean War, my grandmother, who was from the north part of Korea, came down uh, to uh, to Seoul uh, as a refugee. She had a bunch of kids. I don't know exactly why she left one with her parents in the north. Maybe she couldn't just bring all the kids with her. Uh, Maybe 
uh, maybe she left her as a pledge uh, for her to come back and visit um, uh, her parents. I'm not sure why. But, of course, Korea then divided into two. No communication was possible. No travel was possible. And so that was the last time that my grandma saw her daughter. Um, last time that she died without knowing whether she was alive or not. And she carried this guilt all her life, which is why she forbade anyone from talking about her. I didn't know. I didn't find out until um, I was 16 that I had this aunt in North Korea. It's the same way, though, with everyone. Everyone carries some guilt and shame that they don't share with anyone. You know, your boss, high-functioning boss who's doing so well, he carries that guilt and shame around. Your friend who seems to be that so happy, happy all the time, he carries that guilt and shame around. Your family member who is kind and loving, who volunteers for all kinds of things, she needs forgiveness too. So we must tell them. We must tell them to put their hope in Jesus. Put their hope in the Lord. That there is forgiveness. That there is fullness of redemption. That there is love beyond their imagine, imagination. No matter how alone they feel. In what sort of, whatever depth that they are in. Tell them that there is forgiveness. So amazing, it'll make them tremble. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that when we see the cross, we see the price of our redemption. We see your love. We see your justice. We see your holiness. Uh, we see that you have reconciled us to you, our God, our Father. Lord, help us. Give us, through the power of your Spirit, help, give us the power to grasp how wide and long, how deep and, 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 and um, how deep is this love of God. Help us to understand that love today. And may that love transform our hearts and help us to be people who share this love with people who desperately, need, who desperately need it, people who need forgiveness around us, people who need this assurance that you love them, that there is forgiveness and redemption in you. Lord, help us to shout this message of grace to others. Lord, we thank you once again for our redemption. We thank you now. We are your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.